So thinking gratefully, what that reminded me of is if we think gratefully, we become a kinder, gentler version of ourselves. I want you to think for a moment of yourself as a kinder, gentler version of yourself. Doesn't it feel good? When we can let go of some of the expectations we have and simply be in the presence. When I said I wanted us to leave today with a different idea about gratitude and thankfulness and appreciation, it's about the way we look at life. Gratitude is all about our perception in life. It really is, how we look at life. As I said, not what we get, but what we know. That we're grateful that we know the truth. That we're grateful that we have the tools to expand our experience of things. Now, in this human existence, you saw when you're disconnected, it doesn't work quite as well. We have a very limited view of things. And in this human experience, our practice, the normal practice, is COD, cash on demand. When we're given something, we pay for it, right? We want it right here in our hot little hands first, when, before we're ready to give out our thankfulness, our money, our appreciation. Well, I'm asking us to switch that up a little bit. Where we want to be able to recognize that everything we need, not everything we want, but everything we need has already been given. Some of you aren't smiling on that one. It's true, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but everything we need has already been given. It's an ever-unfolding process, and it's how much we accept of that goodness that really determines our experience of life. In Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes created a five-step prayer treatment. It's an affirmative prayer. It's positive, it's affirmative. We already did it. God is all there is. We are one with God. I know, and we simply claim what we already know to be true. We plant in this creative potential of divine mind the truth we know. And we give thanks that it is done. We don't wait for it to be manifested here on this plane to say thank you. We give thanks that it is done, and then we release it, and we let it go. We pay in advance for the good that we know is already at work. You know, it says, in the Bible it says, I answer before you call. I answer because spirit already knows what we need. The answers are already given. It's our level of receptivity and willingness. And as we give thanks in advance, it opens us to a greater experience because gratitude heals. Gratitude opens the heart. Gratitude makes us these kinder, gentler versions of ourselves. Now, would you agree with me that nothing has any meaning except what we give it? You can have something. Two people can be looking at it, and they can have totally different meanings behind it. Nothing has any meaning what we give it than what we give it. And many people think, well... Why should I say thank you? Do you know all the misfortune in my life? Do you know what's going on? I, I, how could I possibly give thanks? One of the beautiful um, spiritual teachers at the beginning of the, I think he was born in 1926, Ken Keyes, and he really, he focused on people being kinder, gentler versions of themselves. He didn't say that, but he had a practice called living love, and that's what he taught. He taught living love, and he said, to see your drama, how many of you have a little bit of drama in your life? A lot of drama. Okay. To see, who doesn't? That's what life, that's what this human life is all about. Anyway, to see your drama clearly is to be liberated from it. And there's a story or a sharing from Goethe. And he was an 18th century German, 18th century statesman, philosopher. Uh, and he said, he shared very near the end of his life. 
that he, if he took away from his life everything he owed other people, there would be very, very, very little left of him. But he didn't stop there. He said, if I let go of all the goodness and, and kindness that people have given me, and my willingness to accept it, but he said more, if I let go of all the harm and hurt given to me by other people, and my willingness to learn from it, there'd be very little left of me. And here's what he said. One of his greatest lessons was to own the experience beyond the event. To own the experience beyond the event. And he said, then, when people harmed me or hurt me, when I could see the experience for me to be strong and courageous and humble and creative, that's when I really grew. He embraced the whole of it. He gave meaning to everything that happens in my life has meaning and purpose. What if you and I looked at all the experience in our lives as stones? And these stones could either be used to build the life that we want, a life of awakening and understanding, a life of enlightenment to lead us to a greater perspective of our life. Or these stones can be the experiences that we drag around with us and weight us down. It's our choice. It's the meaning we give the events in our life. The meaning we give them. Every trial, every trial, is an opportunity for unconditional love. If we choose to expand and learn from it and be that softer, kinder, more expanded expression of ourselves. I know that this is hard to take, but how many of you are really able to embrace the gift of a broken heart? Thank you. First service, do you know first service raised a lot of hands? So I'm going to ask you again. Doesn't mean you've done it already, by golly. Simply means you're willing to. How many of you are willing to embrace the gift of a broken heart? Absolutely. Because a heart can't truly be broken. What's broken is our illusion of how life is supposed to be. People I love are always supposed to stay with me. I'm always supposed to have lots of money in the bank. I'm also always supposed to be healthy. I'm always, always, always these expectations we have about life. It's these broken illusions that feel like a broken heart because dang it, they're painful. And if you know me, you know I truly believe in deep grieving and crying and sadness for a while. But I believe that because I think we need that. And I totally believe in healing. And I totally believe that gratitude is a healing energy on this planet, who be planet because gratitude, unconditional love, kindness are all synonymous to me. So the broken heart that we feel is simply being broken away from illusion and expectation we've had about life. And it calls us to expand our view. Do you agree with me? To see something bigger. And I would imagine that those people that have said they're willing to see the gift of a broken heart have all already seen that a broken heart can break us open to something entirely new and exciting in our life. There is no disaster that cannot become a blessing. No one knew this more profoundly than Jesus. 
Now, in our teaching, we don't look at Jesus as the Savior. We look at Jesus as a master teacher, a way shower, a mystic who knew about unconditional love, who knew about the power and presence of God within, that knew about giving thanks. So today I want to talk about one of the lessons, one of the many lessons that Jesus gave on the power of giving thanks in advance. Now in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, good news, they all had their own communities and their own people that they taught. If a story of Jesus's was told in all four Gospels, it is pretty clear that that was true. And one of the stories that you see in all four of the Gospels is a story that we've all heard of, the story of the fishes and the loaves. But you may not know the whole of the story. Jesus went to the mountain, and he went there to rest. And a crowd followed him. Now, in, there's a little different number in some of the Gospels, but this was not a small crowd between four and 5,000 people followed him to the mountain. And they brought with them their lame, their sick, their blind. They wanted them to be cured and healed. And so it brought Jesus to his feet. And for three days, he healed the sick. He brought sight to the blind. He made the lame walk. He gave his gifts. After those three, the people... Praise God. And after those three days, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and they've had nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry for they might faint on the way down. And he said to the disciples, and the disciples said to him, those of little faith, Where do we get enough bread in the desert to feed all these people? And Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? We have to start where we are. How many loaves do we have right here? And the disciples said, seven loaves and a few small fish. They probably didn't say that as peacefully as I said it. Only seven loaves and three small fish. What are we going to do? And here's what Jesus did. He took the loaves. And these are the words. After giving thanks. Because he knew. He knew. After giving thanks, he broke the loaves. And gave them to his disciples to pass through the crowd. Everyone ate and was filled And there were still bread left over, seven baskets full. Seven baskets full. Jesus gave thanks first because he knew that the same power, the same creative energy, the same word that created the universe is the word that we, you and I, use when we use it in faith, in trust, in reverence and for the good of all. It's the same power that we use. If God is all there is and we are one with that power, the power is within us, that creative energy to create. Ernest Holmes said, when we know that we can multiply the fishes and the loaves, we will do it. When we truly know that we can walk on water, we will do it. It's about giving thanks that we know we have the power to use to create great things. So for you and me, it's about truly understanding right now that Jesus didn't get down on his hands and knees and beg God, I only have seven loaves, God. I only have seven loaves. Will you give me some more, please? He didn't say it that way. He gave thanks. Because in his heart and soul, he knew it was already done. He knew. He said, thank you. And then he did his work. He broke what he had and passed it. He knew without a question. So for us, we need to give thanks and command the law with the power of our word. 
What we speak is powerful. And when we speak for the good of all, for this greater good, when we speak in faith and trust and reverence, it will be done. We need to learn from the teachings of the mystics, from the teachings of Jesus, that we have a power to use and we will bring heaven to earth. It's up to us. When Gretchen was singing, there's still a lot of work to do. I agree. Do you? We have a lot of healing that our world is calling for, and we're called to be the change. We're called to do the work. We're called in our own lives to open the perspective of our thanksgiving, what we're grateful for, to see in a greater way. And we have a call to keep sharing the good. I want to share with you a poem by a contemporary poet. A poem by a contemporary poet that I love, David White, a Scot. And he has entitled this short poem, The Fishes and the Loaves. I want you to remember that thinking gratefully is more than just a thought. It is a state of being, as Bobby shared. It's also a word of action. Thanksgiving is an act, an action that we do. And David White says, This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news. Forget the news. Forget the radio and the blurred screen. Forget all that. This is the time for the fishes and the loaves. People are hungry. People are hungry. And one good word, one kind good word, is bread for a thousand. That's what we're called to do. To become a kinder, gentler version of ourselves doesn't mean we have to do unbelievable things. It means we can share the kindness that is already there. What we must first know is that we are designed for love and kindness and goodness. We're programmed for that. Throughout the years, we've gotten these illusions and deceptive thoughts, and we've become rough on the edge. So this Thanksgiving time, I simply invite us to melt a little, to soften, to loosen up, as you shared from Ernest Holmes this morning, Bobby, to loosen our grip on the way things have to be and to start appreciating and loving and being kind with what is and what we know to be true. Ernest Holmes invites us to pray without ceasing. Now, it doesn't mean you're doing the five steps of the prayer all day and you're walking around trying to remember the five steps and working on that. Prayer without, pray without ceasing means that we live on the affirmative side of life. We look at life knowing that life is good and God is for us. And the universe is a friendly, kind place that is conspiring for our good. The affirmative side of life, it means we release doubt. How are you doing on that one? Remember this, paying in advance takes great strength and great faith and great trust. So the affirmative side of life, releasing doubt and trusting the law of good. So just say after me, I live on the affirmative side of life. And if you're not doing so good at that, just write it down in your program and take it home. I release doubt. I trust the law of good. Beautiful. See, those words come from a heart center. So put your hand on your heart. And I want you to just close your eyes. I invite you to. You don't have to. You can peek. It doesn't really matter. It just kind of centers us in when we close our eyes and focus on the good that's already present. 
This is just a one-line prayer that came from our Science of Mind text. And it simply says, I know that I am divine, and I trust my divinity. So will you just repeat that after me? I know that I am divine. Oh, good memories. Let's say that together. I know that I am divine, and I trust my divinity. I know that I am divine, and I trust my divinity. Right there is a softening that happens. When we enter fear, when we enter doubt, when something comes in our life that we just, oh, how is this going to work out? It's trusting that the plan is already there. I mentioned that I was going to bookend this morning in Meister Eckhart, that beautiful 13th century mystic. I was going to bookend this message in Meister Eckhart quotes. I love this quote. I love the first one, too. I love all the quotes, but um, Meister Eckhart says, Be always ready for the gifts of God. Be always ready for the gifts of God and always for the new ones. Remembering that life is creative all the time. And always remember, God is a thousand times more ready to give. God is a thousand times more ready to give than we are to receive. So our job is to open, to be available, to be kinder, gentler, more peaceful with ourselves and others, and to be grateful. So I know truly that I see the divinity in each and every person here. Right now, I see the divinity in all of you. I am very, very grateful for you. I thank God for you. And I know that together we are creating the change, not just to be kinder, gentler people, but to create a kinder, gentler earth on which we live. I thank you all for being part of it. I'm sorry, yes.